the end of the day, or the end of the outreach, I should say, it's it it a little bit after lunchtime, um, this woman still wearing her McDonald's uniform, just as walked away from work, sees our pool table and walks up to us and ends up talking to me. And we had a great 45-minute conversation. Um, and by the end of it, she became pro-life. Um, and, and it was the most surreal experience of my life because what had happened, it was a little like I, had to, I knew I had to end the conversation because I had a plane to catch. I had to go home. Um, and I, and I, like, so the staff were all kind of watching this. They'd all finished their conversations. They're, they kind of formed this little semicircle, you know, 10 yards away, kind of watching the end of my conversation. I said, I need to go debrief with them. Uh, so I, I, I ended up by saying, like, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for this conversation. I've, I've loved talking to you. I'm really sorry I have to go. I need to go say a few things to these people I've been training. That I need to go catch my flight home. And she said, you've been training them? What have you been training them on? And I said, well, this, <laughs> having good conversations about abortion. She said, really? And she walks right over to them and gives them this spontaneous speech. She says, you should all talk about abortion. This guy is awesome. You should do whatever he says. This has been an amazing conversation. I love this. I loved his body language. I, 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 he seemed relaxed, and that made me feel relaxed, and I felt heard, and now I'm pro-life, but you don't understand. Like, I woke up this morning, I was pro-choice, and now I'm pro-life, and here's this, like, the effect that it has on me, because, you see, like, I have been pro-choice, but I've been not wanting to get pregnant and have an, I don't want to have an abortion, so I've been so afraid of getting pregnant. I haven't been having sex with my husband. And so now I'm not afraid of getting pregnant anymore. I'm going to go home. I'm going to have sex with my husband now. And she left. It was a big day for her and him. Now, here's the point. What I did in that 45 minutes, you could all do. It didn't take some amazing, like, philosophical reasoning. All I had to do was be nice, and I had to make an argument ultimately three times in that conversation before she connected the dots. And that happens sometimes. That's fine. It's a little bit philosophical. I had to make this thing that we call the equal rights argument three times, and after I said it the third time, everything clicked for her. And she became pro-life and had this crazy, cool experience. Um, so I don't want you to think that only young people can convince people to be pro-life or only like really smart people or philosopher types. Can, like, you can totally do this. You can all be nice to people. <laughs> you can all listen to people, like really listen. We'll talk more about listening to my other dialogue tips talk. You should totally come. Um, but you can also make this argument. See, one of, the, one of the reasons that we started Equal Rights Institute three years ago, my brother and I started this. My brother's a philosophy grad from Biola. And three years ago, we launched this organization be, uh, for a couple of reasons. One was we wanted to help the pro-life movement to become more like Jesus. Like, what would it look like if Jesus talked to a pro-choice person? What would his body language be like? What kinds of questions would he ask? What kinds of questions would he not ask? And what would it sound like when he made arguments that are grounded in truth, not holding back from the truth? but spoken with gentleness and grace and love. Like, what would that look like? We want to help the pro-life movement to get closer to that mark. And one of our values from the very beginning was that we wanted to be an innovative and flexible apologetics organization. We're not just sticking with the same training material, uh, you know, because when we go into college campuses, we try new things. A college campus, that's our lab. We love to do R&D. The status is never quo. So we're always trying new things. I've got right now in my head, I've got multiple things I really, really want to try at our next set of outreaches. I don't know if they'll work, but they might. They might fail miserably um, and never talk about them again. But they might be awesome. If I'm speaking here in a year, like you might be hearing a different talk because we might have learned new things. We're trying to figure out what connects with pro-choice people right now. Like, what is persuasive to young pro-choice people right now? Pro-choice college students are different today than they were five years ago. That matters. So our training content changes. So we always cared about being innovative and flexible. We love doing R&D. But I'll tell you, the most uh, crazy case of R&D going really well for us has to do with this argument that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. See, I spent most of my career teaching people a certain argument of how do we respond to people when they say that the unborn aren't persons. Ryan was right. Almost no one says they're not human anymore. Like, you have to be an NPR person like to say that. Like, there's almost no one saying they're not human. Like, come on. 
But a lot of people don't, like almost all purchase people, do not think that the unborn is like you and me, right? They think that there's something different and, that, and there's something so different it morally matters. That is one of the two primary disagreements between pro-life and pro-choice people. The other one has to do with bodily rights. We're not talking about that today. We don't have time. Although I talked about that two years ago here, and it's on YouTube. You can go watch that if you want. But today we're talking about personal arguments. So I spent most of my career teaching a certain way of how to respond to pro-choice people who say that the unborn doesn't morally matter. And then several years ago, Tim and I and Steve Wagner, Justice for All, and, and some other people across the country all started trying something new. It's not our argument. We learned it from this guy named Dr. J.P. Moreland of Bioli. He's a brilliant philosopher. Um, and, and Steve heard him say something, and then my brother and him spent a lot of time trying to like, modify it for use on campus, and we just started trying it all over the country. And I have never seen any argument change more minds about abortion on the spot, ever. Like, it be, got to the point where our debrief sessions, where we'd sit in like a circle at the end of our of our outreach and kind of talk, it, they be, almost became, like it was like the same thing every time. Someone raised their hand, I saw someone become pro-life today. Cool, what happened? Oh, I used the equal rights argument. Oh, okay, you know, it's like, it's like we, I've heard this story before. Because like this was so, it happened all the time. And so it, because it's so persuasive, we decided like we want more pro-life people using this argument because it is so persuasive. It is not the easiest argument in the world to use, but you can totally do it. It's worth it even though it's a little bit more complicated, it is super persuasive. And I'll tell you first why I think it's persuasive. There's a couple reasons why I think this argument is so persuasive, and then I'll explain it to you. Um, I think part of it is so persuasive because it is very obvious to pro-choice people when we make this argument that this is not a religious argument. I'm a religious person, but when I'm talking to an atheist, I'm not opening up with Bible verses because they don't believe in the Bible like I do. So there's this like weird thing that like every, happens every once in a while. You'll see like this very well-meaning pro-life would be like, oh, you're, you're pro-choice? Well, let me show you Psalm 139 and Jeremiah 1.5. And do you know that second trimester, John the Baptist kicked in his mother's womb in the presence of first trimester Jesus? And they're like, what are you talking about? Like, it'd be like if some, like a Muslim came to you and be like, I'm going to prove to you that you're wrong by reading you verses out of the Quran. Like it wouldn't convince you because you don't believe that the Quran is this, is this like source of truth, right? So that's, so I'm starting with atheists on science and philosophy, this area where we both agree, and sometimes those conversations will turn religious at, uh, at the end, sometimes they don't, it's a judgment call. We have a motto, every conversation is a series of difficult judgment calls, and this prayer without ceasing. So this argument is clearly not religious, and it's clearly, uh, not an emotional argument, and it has equality in premise one. This is the thing that our, my generation cares about more than maybe anything else. I've got a good friend who's a very, uh, like, uh, I don't know the right phrase, like high-powered lawyer or something like that. It's probably the wrong phrase, but she's a big deal. Um, and she, ta she told me, she learned in law school that if you can show in your case that equality is on your side, you can stop arguing. It's over. Like, like equality really, really matters to our generation. Um, and so what I'm going to do is we're purposefully getting the pro-choice person to take a, a short break in the conversation from talking about abortion, which can actually in itself be a good thing because if, when we're talking about abortion, they're kind of tense. So we're going to try to get them, let's take a little break, let's talk about this thing and, and connect them with this thing that they're very passionate about, equality. And that's a good thing because what's going to happen down the road is I'm going to try to um, put a, an internal tension uh, in their mind between their pro-choice views and their pro-equality views. I'm going to argue that to be truly pro-equality, they have to be pro-life. And that is sometimes enough to get people to change their mind about abortion. Because a lot of times, while they do care about being a pro-choice person, they care more about being able to self-identify as being pro-equality. So if I can show them you got to choose, a lot of times they will pick equality over their pro-choice views. I also think this is it's, it's very effective in the way it responds to the uh, the pro-choice counter argument. So I'm going to show you all of that. Here's kind of the structure of the argument. There's three questions going on in the beginning of this argument. The first question is, do we have an equal right to life? The next question is, doesn't that mean that there's something the same about us? Which sort of leads to the last question, what is that thing? What is the same about us? Now there's something important for you to note. The word we in the first question does not refer to the unborn or else this would be a circular argument. We're not starting with fetal personhood as premise one. What we're doing is we are accepting the fact that for most of our society, the unborn are not obvious cases of personhood. 
So what we're doing instead is we're going to get them talking about the clearest case of persons, human adults. And then we're going to go deeper on that than maybe they ever have. We're going to try to figure out some stuff going on that is grounding equal rights for human adults. And then we're going to try to apply that knowledge over to the less clear case, the unborn. So this isn't the way it sounds when I actually make the argument. I'm not like, question one, do we deserve, like it's not, it doesn't sound like that. It sounds a lot more organic. Um, I'll give you an example of what it sounds like usually when I do it in person. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a story. We were at UC Davis last spring at the most volatile outreach that we've ever experienced. Um, it, was an, it was actually weird when we showed up. Um, I've never seen this before. There were pro, pro-choice protesters ready for us and, and, and in place before we, like well, when we walked onto the campus. And we got there like eight in the morning. I was like, wow, good on them. Like they're really, like they're on it, you know? And they had their signs, my body, my choice, and blah, blah, blah. And they had some umbrellas, which I thought was weird. It's a real like hot sunny day and they're under a huge tree, but whatever. Um, they weren't where we were gonna set up though. So we went over to this flagpole area on this quad at UC Davis where there were no protesters. Huh, okay. So we set up our poll table. Um, we've added an it depends option. So it says, should abortion remain legal? And then it has yes, it depends, and no. So that everyone can see from even far away that we're nuanced, we get it. You can, like, whatever you identify with, come and talk to us. Um, no protesters. But then at one point, someone walked down the other direction, the opposite direction from when we came, and there's another little group of protesters down there, hundreds of yards away, with signs and umbrellas. It's like, what is going on? So we found out what happened. Um, that, so someone had tipped them off that pro-lifers were coming, and they thought we were bringing big, big graphic abortion picture signs, which we didn't. We used graphic pictures in a brochure with our consent. That's our style. Um, and so we just had this pool table set up. So they were asking every student that walked by, do you want an umbrella escort? Do you, do you want us to walk by with, a, you know, with an umbrella like the penguin to protect you from the scary pictures? And like, li- like literally, I never saw anyone take them up on it. Like everyone must have said, no, I'm all right. And then they walked by our, our pool table with words on signs. So when we realized uh, a couple hours into the hour that this was going on, like I asked my brother, it's like, should we tell them? And he was like, no, nah, it's fine, you know? So anyway, around noon, they figured it out, and they formed this big protest in front of our thing, eventually kind of blocked access, got really intimidating. It was pretty interesting. And eventually one girl vandalized our pool table and everything on it while I was sitting on it talking to people. But before that happened... I was talking to these three girls, and they were kind of venting at me for a while about why they're pro-choice, and then to her credit, this one asked me, she said, I want to know why you're pro-life. Why are you here? What's your argument? I said, I think I can explain to you in like two minutes why I'm pro-life. She said, go. What would you do with that two minutes? This is what I did. I said, I'm an open-minded person which means uh, that I, I, uh, there are only two things that I believe that I'm 100% sure of. Two plus two is four in a base 10 system and my own existence. Everything else is on a spectrum of confidence for me. I've got some views that I'm really confident in, like the pro-life view and that some form of Christianity is true. I've got other views that I'm totally, I have no confidence in my view on that. And then there's stuff, stuff in the middle. Basically, this means I live a very uncomfortable life. Uh, I hold a lot of my views with a pretty open hand, and my friends that are 100% sure that they're right about everything are just more comfortable. So, uh, so this is a little bit about me. But even though I'm open-minded, there's one view that I have that would be really, really hard for you to change my mind on, and it's this. It said, everyone that I can see right now has an equal right to life. Like, we're outside on this quad. It's about lunchtime. This is where people have lunch. We could easily see, like, hundreds of people. There's like, I could see more people at that moment than I can see in this room right now. Uh, and so I said, there's something kind of interesting about that view, though, isn't there? Like, there's so many differences. Like, right, I mean, I, I see some people who are really tall, and I see some people who are really short. I see some people who are really smart, and I see some people who are, you know, trying their best. <laughs> it's fine. And I've seen some people who are really good at sports and music and those that are not. How can we, I've seen four people roll by here in wheelchairs today. There's all these differences. So how can we possibly explain this thing that we already agree on? Like everyone basically in Western civilization agrees we have an equal right to life as human adults. But how can we possibly explain that when there are so many differences? Okay, so what I've done is I've set up that first question. And then usually at this point, I would stop and let them kind of respond, but I only had two minutes, so I just kept going. 
I said, it seems to me that if we have an equal right to life, there must be a reason for that. There must be something that we all have in common. And this is key. It has to be something that we all have equally. It cannot be a thing that you can have more or less of. It can't be like a dimmer switch. It's got to be like a light switch. It's got to be like an all or nothing kind of a thing. Or else it's not going to ground equality. Like you, you could have someone be like, oh yeah, humans are equally valuable because they're all intelligent. <laughs> no, that's not going to do the job of explaining equal rights. Why? Because we're not all equally intelligent. If you don't believe that, go to YouTube today, read the comments under the first video that you stumble upon, and you will see some people think better than others. It's okay, they still have an equal right to life for a different reason, but like, it's, it's, it's not going to be something like intelligence. It's got to be something that we all have equally. What is that thing? I said, I think it is something like humanness. Something like being human. Humanness. Something like that. Um, and if the unborn have that, which they do, then they're in. They get an equal right to life. Regardless of what our like, intuitions are. And the last thing I said to the girls before I stopped, because I still had 30 seconds left, I said, notice this is not a religious argument, and notice this is also not an emotional argument. I'm not pro-life for emotional reasons. I don't get like the warm fuzzies when I look at a picture of an embryo. I don't. I don't. I'm sorry. Like, I don't have that thing that happens like when like my friends recently put a picture of their newborn on Facebook. And there's a cute baby too this time, which is not always what happens on my Facebook newsfeed. And but it's fine. They all have an equal right to life. They're all equally human. It's fine. But this was a cute baby, and I had that thing we all have. It's like, oh, the baby. You know, we all have that thing. Tugs at our heartstrings. I do not have that when I look at a zygote. Looks like a fuzzy orange. It's not tugging at my heartstrings. So this is not, I'm not pro-life for emotional reasons. I'm pro-life because it is the most rational conclusion that I can come to. Because I'm starting with equality as premise one, and I'm reasoning from there. I'm very convinced in equality more than anything else. And then I just have not found a rational view that makes sense of equality for human adults that says that the unborn are out. I've heard a lot of different attempts. I have not yet heard one that works. So this is why I'm pro-life. I'm pro-equality, so I'm pro-life. Now, what sometimes happens is they will respond by saying, okay, well, I don't think that humanness or anything like humanness is actually the thing that we all have in common. I think the thing that matters is something else. Cool, let's talk about that. And when they respond with something, I'm going to ask in my head three questions. It's like a rubric that happens when I assess their worldview about personhood. I'm trying to figure out, does their view make sense by asking myself these three questions? The first one is, does this explanation entail equal rights for adults? If it doesn't do that, it's not even close to the right answer, all right? But usually, they'll almost always pass that first one. The second question I'm going to ask is, does their explanation for equality entail equal rights for infants? Because as a father who is there at the birth of my three sons... Uh, my view that infants go in the equal right to life circle, like they get an equal right to life, is basically a properly basic belief for me. Uh, I, I don't even think I should have to defend that view. I can, I just don't really know that I should have to. And then the last question I'm going to ask is, does their explanation entail equal rights for animals? Because I don't think it should. So these are the, I'm not asking these out loud. This is what's going on in my head. So let me hear from you. What are some definitions of personhood that you have heard from pro-choice people? What are some things that you've heard pro-choice people say, people say you have to have in order to be a person? Emotions, good. Consciousness, yes. Soul and intellect. You had a pro-choice person say that you need a soul? That's interesting. I want to talk to that person. Yes. Viability, yes. Being able to survive outside of uterus, yes, over here. Self-awareness, very, very good in the back. Not dependent on someone else. Yes. Breathing, yes. Anyone else? This is like, oh, this is like a very, very long list. This is good. Being wanted. If they'll just say that, like really clarify, this is what the thing that they think. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Oh, over, and one more over here. And, or two more. Having a heart. Quality of life. Awesome. Okay. So these are the questions I'm asking myself whenever I hear any of these things. Um, and, but what I'm going to do to try to show them like, what I'm seeing is I'm going to tell them a thought experiment. I think stories are really helpful when persuading people. 
And so I'm going to tell him a story. This is a story that my brother Tim came up with that we call the zoo shooting. So we're going to say, imagine, so let's say the protest person says, for sake of the argument, um, you need to be minimally uh, aware of your own, uh, let's, say, let's say sentience. Let's say they've got to know, uh, like be minimally aware of the world around them. Like I hear this a lot on college campuses now. If you, you have to be minimally aware of the world around you, or something like that to be in. Like imagine there's an equal, equal right to life circle. We're trying to figure out what goes into the circle, right? So, okay, cool. Sentience, let's think about that. Imagine we go to the zoo, we're hanging out in front of the elephant exhibit and a gunman shows up and starts shooting. And he gets six bullets fired before he's tackled by Chuck Norris. I don't actually say that to college students because they don't get it, but I, for here, <laughs> Just looking to st- I know your audience and kind of figured you'd, I, I think it's funny, but no, no one else my age does. All right, so he's tackled by security or whatever. Uh, and so let's think about those six bullets. The first bullet goes into the bushes and kills the world's unluckiest cockroach. I think that's funny too, but I'm kind of dark and twisted. So <laughs> that's just anything being that unlucky and just exploding out of nowhere. I think that's kind of funny. Okay, so the first bullet goes to the bushes, kills a cockroach. The second bullet kills a squirrel. Third bullet kills an elephant. It was a big bullet. (laughs) Fourth bullet kills a newborn. The fifth bullet kills a toddler. This is is my second oldest son, William, by the way. Ryan's not the only one that can put his kids on PowerPoint. (laughs) He could be a model. We could be making money off of him. Are you kidding me? I always say, like, my kids were biologically predestined to be cute because my wife is gorgeous. Like, it was just not going to happen any other way. This is just how it was, it was, it was going to happen. And the sixth bullet kills an adult stock photo model. Okay. <laughs> now, remember, we are assessing a worldview here. How many of these things go into the equal right to life circle? Well, we're assessing sentience, being minimally aware, uh, aware of the world around you. If that is the thing that gets you in the circle... How many things go in the circle? All of them. Even cockroaches are minimally aware of the world around them. And this is the problem with the view that we point out. It's not the only problem with the view. I'm talking about persuasiveness. I have, this is what I've seen convince a lot of people, more than talking about like coma cases and things like that. It's talking about the fact that th- there's basically a squirrel problem here. Squirrels are equal to toddlers under this view, and that's a really big problem. Now. I'm gonna, I'm, I can find common ground. Like even with like, I, I meet a lot of like animal rights type activists. I can find a lot of common ground with those people. Like sincerely. I'm really concerned about the way we treat chickens and cows in factory farms in our country. Like I don't think chickens and cows are equal to humans. But I think the fact that they feel pain morally matters. It, that, that affects how we should treat them. Um, I'm at this point convinced we shouldn't have killer whales and dolphins in like SeaWorld, for example. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of that. The Cove uh, and Blackfish are two, real, I think, really good documentaries. I don't agree with everything in those documentaries, but I agree with enough that I'm convinced. So I can find common ground. I just can't get to the, like, to the person who says they're actually equal. We meet extremists sometimes are like, but, uh, maybe they'll even say that animals are more valuable <laughs> um, than because like, they're not messing up the planet kind of thing. Uh, and we'll try. We'll try some things. Like I met one of those guys on a train going from Bakersfield to Fresno one time where I was just coming from an outreach at Pasadena City College. And I'm sitting across from this guy. I love trains. It's so much more comfortable than planes. Um, and so I'm sitting at this booth thing. I have my computer out. And this guy sits across from me with a textbook this thick. I was like, what is that? And he's like, it's about robotics. I want to be on the team that makes the first artistic robot. I was like, cool. Let's talk about that. So we talked about art. And I robot and the three laws of robotics and like all kinds of things. And then he asked me about what I do. And I said, oh, I just came from this outreach. I was talking to persuasive people about abortion. And one of the things is, <laughs> I know, I have a weird job. Um, and I, but I, I commented, like one of the things that I kind of observed that weekend was I talked to people from all ways of life, particularly atheists and agnostics. But I talked to like persuasive people from all religions too. And you know, just about everyone I talked to agrees that there's something special about humans. I just noted that. And he said, oh, my girlfriend would disagree with you. I said, I don't think she would. (laughs) And he's like, no, really, she would. I'll I'll prove it to you. If she ever accidentally kills a fly, and this is on my dumb brain, I'm like, how do you accidentally kill a fly? Like, have you ever tried to kill a fly? Like, it's really hard. I don't think that's what he meant. So let's be charitable. We're going to assume he didn't misbe. I think he meant if she accidentally kills a bug. All right. So I'm going to say it, I'll fix it for him. If my girlfriend ever accidentally kills a bug, 
see as a moment of silence. I thought about that. I said, I don't think C thinks humans and animals are the same. And I'll prove it to you. If she ever accidentally ran over a kid, she wouldn't just have a moment of silence, right? Like, it would at least wreck her day, right? It, like, it would at least, it would probably be one of the worst things that ever happened to her, but it's not just going to be like this moment where she gets out of the car and it's like, namaste, and moves on. It's going to be an event. And he was like, and I'm not, I, I, Californians don't all talk like this, but I'm kid, I kid you not. He said, dude! you're right. <laughs> he said, I'm going to go talk to her about that tonight. I'm sure they had an amazing evening. <laughs> He's on the couch. Uh, and so anyway, okay. So like, this is like, we can, we'll kind of push these people. Like we've had the people still like kind of bite that bullet. This is, a, this is how extreme we'll go. This is a little bit mean, but we'll, we'll, I'll, sometimes I'll tell animal rights people about my brother's old uh, roommate who was a hunter. And my brother told the story one time about how, how his roommate had gone out and, and went to hunt deer. And he, he stalked a deer, he shot it, he killed it, and he brought it home, skinned it, made sausage out of it, and they ate it for breakfast. Which for my brother, like, we're city boys. We're like, we're like this is like the closest, fewest degrees of separation that my brother's ever been from, like, the, 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 the meal and the, the animal. And so he's having this whole existential experience. Um, but, like, we, I will tell that story to an animal, right? And they'll be like, oh my gosh! And I'm like, I know, right? Uh, he'll be like, oh, it's horrible, right? Yeah, what, should, what do you think should happen to the roommate? He should be in jail, right? That's awful. How long do you think he should be in jail for? Probably something like six months. Six months? What do you mean? Six, what if he did that to a girl? Are you tracking with me, pro-lifers? Sometimes pro-life thought experiments get kind of grim. I'm just going to spell this out for you. I'm sorry. If his roommate stalked a girl, shot her, brought her home, skinned her, made sausage out of her, and ate her for breakfast, he should be in a Hannibal Lecter mask in a plastic jail talking to Jodie Foster for the rest of his life. Come on. What are you talking about six months? I hope they can't hear. <laughs> I just realized, I just probably toned it down. Um, like, it's easy to stand on this beautiful color screen and be like, I'm all about equality, man. It's a hard thing to live it. Okay, but so we'll push people who say that they think animals and humans are the same. I don't think that's the case. I think, I think we shouldn't mistreat animals. But I do not think it is the same thing when 50 elephants are rounded up and shot and 50 humans are rounded up in a field and shot. Those are not the same thing morally. That's my point. Okay, now what will often happen is they will change targets. I'll say, okay, well, clearly it can't be sentience that gets you in, or we have a squirrel problem. So they'll change to something more advanced. They'll, make the, they'll raise the bar. I'll say maybe something like you need to be self-aware. You need to be like aware that you're, you exist and will exist over a period of time. Cool. Let's work with that. Let's think about that. Okay, zoo shooting. Cockroach, squirrel, elephant, newborn, toddler, adult woman. How many go into the equal right to life circle? Not all. Not one. Three? Someone said three. Which three? Mm -mm. Yeah, someone got it back there. Uh, the adult woman, the toddler, and the elephant. But not the newborn. Newborns are not self-aware. Newborns are not self-aware until probably something like four to six months after birth. And yet elephants are. Elephants are one of the few mammals that are self-aware or uh, certainly present a lot of uh, properties of self-awareness. For example, uh, elephants can recognize, if you put a, a red dot on an elephant's forehead and put it in front of a big mirror, it'll use its trunk and rub at its forehead, which indicates, this is called the mirror test, it indicates that it knows it's looking at its own reflection and not another similar looking elephant. Um, they also mourn their dead in really interesting ways. Um, they'll have a whole kind of burial, you know, gravesite kind of ceremony type thing, and then they'll leave, and then even years later, they will come back, the herd will come back and have another ceremony at the same gravesite. That indicates being aware of existence over a period of time. So I think elephants are self-aware. I don't think they're persons. I don't think they're in. I don't think self-awareness is a thing. 
But this is what we'll point out. This view has two big problems. See, all these pro-choice views have at least one of the two problems. They either let too many things into the equal right to life circle, like squirrels, or they exclude too many things like newborns. This is a case where it does both problems, and I will push back really hard on both. Like, you have a, you have a newborn problem. Newborns are not in under this view. I don't think that's a good, uh, I don't think that's a view that makes sense of the world around us. And also, you've got some animals like magpies and squirrels I'm not squirrels, sorry, magpies and elephants that are in. And I don't think that's the world that I live in either. So I want us all to kind of practice this thing that I'm doing in my head. I'm doing this rubric thing when I hear them say these different things. I'm trying to figure out whether these things go into the equal rights life circle or not. So think of it. Remember, there's this kind of test that we're doing. A good explanation for equal rights is going to include adults, it's going to include infants, and it's going to exclude animals. So let's all do this together. You ready? This is like the interactive portion. Like, are you ready? All right. So let's say someone says you need to have the ability to think. It means you need to have mental processing. Would that include adults? No, because here's the problem. This is one of those degreed things. This is, like a, this is like a dimmer switch. You can have more or less of mental processing. This one fails right out of the get-go. Now, most pro-choice people don't mean a degreed property like this. So if you kind of point this out, say, like, this is a problem, smarter people are now more valuable, um, they'll quickly move to something non-degreed, like the ability to have mental processes at all. All right, so if we have the ability to, uh, to have mental processes at all, would that include adults? Yes. Would that include infants? Yeah. Would that exclude animals? Mm -mm. So that's the problem. That's what I'm going to push really hard against. Like, it seems like most animals have at least some mental processes at all. That's a problem because now they're in the equal rights life circle. I don't think that's the world I live in. Let's do another one. Pain, the physical feeling caused by disease, injury, or something that hurts the body. Does that include adults? Yeah. Does it include infants? Yep. Outside of, like, I know there's really rare kind of exceptions, like Gabby Gingras, who doesn't have the ability to feel pain. My personal view is pointing out cases like that are not that actually persuasive to pro-choice people, although they ought to be. They aren't because they kind of feel like it's a loophole. Um, exclude animals. Nope. Almost all animals feel pain. So that's going to be the problem. I'm going to push against that view. What about self-awareness? Able to reflect on one's own existence at all. I kind of did this one for you, so this will be a little bit easier. Will that include adults? Yes. Will that include infants? Mm -mm. Will, that in uh, will that exclude animals? Not that either. So two problems. And which one I choose to, to point out first will depend on what I had for lunch that day. Viability, able to survive outside of uterus. We're doing a lot of the ones that you guys pointed out. Uh, will that include adults? Yeah. Uh, would that include infants? Yeah. Would that exclude animals? Mm -mm. There's a whole bunch of animals able to survive outside of uteruses. Right? Now, there's other things I can point out. Again, I can point out that viability is kind of the weirdest line to draw because it's the only moving target. Like, it's moving backwards as our technology gets better, and that's kind of odd uh, if you think that's what makes a person, but we'll also point this out. Uh, sentience, minimal ability to perceive the world. It's usually what people mean by that word, although not always. You've got to ask them. What do you mean by that? Uh, include adults. Yep. Will that include infants? Mm -hmm. Some of you are kind of wondering, like, oh, what I thought, well, I'm not sure exactly. Okay. Exclude animals? Nope. That's a big problem. A whole bunch of animals. Almost all animals are sentient, at least at some level. Um, so these are going to be the problems that I'm pointing out to the person. And then I'm arguing that I think a view that makes more sense is something like humanists. You might notice I'm not saying humanists exactly. There are weird philosophical reasons for that that would, I'm not really going to get into. I think it is something like humanists, something like being made in God's image, where I think this, that's what it means to be made in God's image. I don't think it's biological humanists exactly. But when I've tried, I've, I've tried. We tried with pro-choice people, giving them this long, more nuanced definition of personhood, and it almost always derails our conversations. So we found, for pragmatic reasons, for 99% of pro-choice people, I'm just going to say something like humanists. They don't even notice that I'm not being super, like, I, I'm being a little bit vague. I'm being a little bit vague on purpose to help the conversation. Um, this is all you need to know. We only pull out the other stuff with like philosophy professors. So you don't really need to deal with that. If you want to come up to me at my booth sometime and ask me about it, fine. But it'll take a while. Um, so uh, that's basically there. So I'm going to sum up and then basically I'm going to go to Q&A for the rest of our time. This is the most persuasive argument we've ever found in the, in the, in the sense that We've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of purchase people become pro-life on the spot because of this argument. I think because of the equality side. Um, and so we're arguing that it seems obvious that all human adults have an, have an equal right to life. 
It seems like that must be because there's something that we all have in common. It must be something that we all have equally. What could that thing be? It can't be something you can have more or less of. It's got to be a, a non-degreed property, meaning it's got to be like a light switch. It's an all or nothing kind of a thing. And all the pro-choice answers have at least one of two problems. They either let too many things into the equal right to life circle or they exclude too many things like newborns. And I think arguing that it's something like humanists is the thing that gets you in makes a lot more sense of the world around us. That gets the right answers. Um, and this is what we see change pro-choice minds a lot. So I'm going to go to Q&A in about two minutes. First, real quick, I'm going to give, this is my little advertisement. If you want to hear more from us and we'll learn more of the arguments that we're finding work really well, we created a course last year because I want to help the entire pro-life movement become more like Jesus and make better arguments, and I can't do that by going physically and speaking in front of every pro-life person. There's just way too many of us. Uh, we're doing really well at that, but I, we needed something like a video course. So if you get this course, um, it's only $39 for an, for a, an, an individual. Um, you go through, there's about 14 hours of content right now on the site. It keeps on growing because we add a podcast every other week. The podcast is awesome. In fact, here's some of the titles from the podcast just to kind of give you a sense of, ooh, I love our podcast. It's so awesome. Um, and so you're getting uh, AC videos. You can download all the audios. You can download the podcast. There's a forum for just the members to interact with each other and ask more questions. We interact with you. You ever have that thing where you're like, you hear a speaker, you're like, that's really cool. I want to be able to interact more with them, but then you have a hard time like getting in touch with them because there's too many people emailing us. This is a way you can interact with us. We spend a lot of time with the people who are like, I'm going to buy in a little bit. I'm going to help support what Equal Rights Institute is doing by buying this really cool course. It's super, super cheap. It's like a Starbucks every week for a little while. It's not a big deal. Um, and help us, and we get to interact a lot with you, and that makes our podcast better. Having said all that, if you also want just to get free stuff, you're like, I'm not paying a dime. I just want free stuff. We've got free stuff you can have, too. We've got a really good blog. We've got about 150 articles on the blog. I'm really proud of the stuff that we write. Um, if you text ERI to 38470, that'll send you to a link where you can really quickly and easily subscribe on your phone. I'm just going to leave that up there because uh, if you go too fast on this, like no one's going to do it. So at this point, I will take Q&A. How much time do we have? So give me a sense. 10 minutes. 10 minutes for questions. Over here. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and just clarify a couple things there. So in, d during the debates about Roe versus Wade, Justice Blackman famously said, it seems like if we establish that the unborn's a person, then they would totally have a right to life, right? And, they're, and the Pritchard lawyer was like, yeah. They're like, okay. But then what they said in that case, they said because so many people disagree about personhood, you've got all these philosophers and doctors and all these other people that disagree, we're just justices and lawyers. Like, we're, like who are we to, to come down and decide what's a person? So they said, we're going to table personhood. We're not even going to consider it. And we're going to decide the case based on other factors having to do with the woman. And that's where they came up with the trimester framework. And then in KCV Planned Parenthood 20 years later or so, then they, they cut the line at viability, gutted all the reasoning from Roe, because Roe was so horribly decided, and then amazingly replaced it with two worse arguments, which is a, a, quite a feat. Get, uh, but go ahead. So what's, what's your question? Yeah, I would say I agree. Lots of people disagree about what's a person, but that doesn't mean that we can't find moral truth. Uh, lack of consensus doesn't mean lack of truth. A lot of people used to disagree about whether black people were people. Um, and yet there is a right answer <laughs> to that question and is right for us to try to protect uh, people who are vulnerable of being oppressed or hurt or whatever. Um, and so I would say let's have, uh, like, let's have the, the best philosophical arguments from both sides kind of compete David and Goliath style and I think we win because we have far better arguments. I would say, you don't table it. This is the issue. This is the thing. Don't table it. Let's talk about it. Um, and don't just kind of do this kind of cowardly thing of like, oh, well, you know, some people disagree, so we're not going to, like, no, no, no. This matters. We should have talked about it. That's what I would That's what I would have said. Behind you. This is a great question. Okay, so we call this the human plus argument. The argument, the, 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 the question for those of you that didn't hear was, what, what do you do if someone says that you need to be like human plus sentient? to be in. Like, this is a really tricksy move because it seems to get all the right answers except for, for the unborn, right? Um, and so we're experimenting. So one of the things that I kind of referenced earlier that I really want to test, I've actually got a new idea of how to respond to this, but I'm not going to tell you because I haven't tested it. Um, but I'll tell you what we usually say. Um, it's hard because we have to try to help the person see that they're being what's called ad hoc which means that they're reasoning backwards. They know the answer they want to end up with, 
and they're trying to figure out where, what they need to believe to end up with the conclusion that they wanted from the beginning. That is the wrong way to do reasoning. You should do it the other way around. You reason from premises, and then the con- you know, and then you form your your conclusion from that. So they're reasoning backwards, and you can tell they're doing it. So my brother one time had that he was doing an outreach with Justice for All, and this, these two philosophy professors brought their entire class out to watch the professors debate. Uh, was someone there, and it turned out to be Tim, because Tim loves this stuff. He's like, oh, bring the philosophy professors to me. Uh, and so they're having this thing. And there's a couple of cool stories from that day, but, the one, but, but one of them kind of did this move. He said, well, I think you need to be human and sentient. And so the way Tim responded, he said, would you agree that it would be ad hoc if you said that what you need to be a person is to be a human, not fetus? Like a human non-fetus. Would you agree that's ad hoc? He's like, oh, yeah, that would definitely be ad hoc. That would be very, like, I'm reasoning backwards. He's like, isn't that kind of what you just did? Like, why are you adding human to sentience? Because you don't want a scroll problem. Um, you're, you, you, by saying human plus sentience and trying to come up with this more complicated, like where you bring uh, multiple things together that are like these mutually sufficient conditions, you're basically doing that. It's just more subtle. <laughs> Um, it's a bad way to do reasoning. And she was like, no, I'm not being ad hoc. And then she left. And then she came back later and she said, you got me. When her class was not watching. She was like, that was good. You, you had me there. So that's what we usually say nowadays. Ask me again in a year. I might have figured out something really cool that's a different way that might even be better. But we'll see. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, have I dealt with people who are saying, like, it's, it's more about equity than equality? We have to kind of, well, I, like, we have to sometimes shift things to kind of create equality or, 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 or whatever. Um, I haven't dealt with someone saying that, although I do know that's, that's something going on for whatever reason that hasn't come up in our conversations. And I would say probably something like, um, I think at least in some cases I agree, that's kind of what we're trying to do. Um, right now there's not equality because I think people are really confused about the unborn, and so we're trying to show like there's an equality problem here, and we want to fix that and bring equity into it. I kind of say like that's kind of my job. Um, cool, let's work together on it. Anyone else? Yes, over here. Yeah, so that's a good question. Someone actually just recently asked me this. He sent me this this article that kind of made this is like the substance view of personhood, where it's like um, like you have to have existed through a continuity. If there's a break in the continuity, it seems really really weird. I haven't found this to connect with most pro-choice people, although I think it's totally a rational, logical argument. I agree with the argument, um, but it sounds a lot more philosophically high-minded than the equal rights argument. And so I, sometimes I just see people's eyes kind of glaze over when they're like, like I've, so I saw there's an article recently. It was like, you should ask pro-choice people, were you ever a fetus? And then kind of, kind of go from there. I haven't found that to actually be, be effective, although I agree with the argument, basically. So again, I care both about what's true and also what's persuasive. I think that one falls into the one, but I haven't found, but to be fair, maybe I haven't tested it enough. I haven't found it worked very well in the past. In the back. Okay, so apathetic people are the most annoying people in the world for me. Like I have a hard time, like sometimes I'll be like, you know, it doesn't really matter because one day the world's gonna explode or, or maybe it's gonna become like a big ice ball. <laughs> it's like, it's like it doesn't matter. Like care about something. Uh, I don't even like, care. Like, find something. Like, go do something for the world. Um, so I would try to. Conv- I would try to say like, like, but kind of what I usually say. And, I, and this was an original. I saw some of the pro life person say this, and I liked it. Um, was like, I think you should care about this issue, even if I'm wrong. If pro choice people are right, this issue really matters because that would mean that people like me are trying to make a medical procedure illegal and way more dangerous. That matters. If I'm right, there's 3,000 kids getting killed every day. That really matters. So either way, I think this really matters. This is huge, like, human rights injustice going on. I probably asked them about a really obvious thing to care about. Like, do you care about sex trafficking? Um, and I'm hoping he'd be like, yeah, that's bad. Okay, I do care about that. Okay, I, I, so is there something similar going on for me? I'm not saying they're exactly the same. Obviously, there's a lot of differences. But, like, for me, this is something like that. A lot of people are being harmed, um, and they shouldn't be because people are you know, doing the wrong thing or confused about them. And I kind of try to, I try to get them out of their apathy. It doesn't usually work in one conversation. I would need to be like friends with a person for maybe a year and see them grow probably, but good luck. Time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, so I've got the three minute warning. So my body, my choice. So uh, I think this is the best pro-choice argument, or at least there's a version of it that is the best pro-choice argument. If you go on YouTube and look up Josh Brom bodily rights argument, you'll see the talk I gave in this room two years ago um, on the subject. It's too complicated. It is a, it is a complicated argument. 
um, at least one of them. And I think it's really important for pro-life people to both understand this argument, including the most philosophically advanced versions, and be able to respond to them well. And I can't really do that in the 10 seconds that I have left. So I would encourage you, though, you should come back and hear my afternoon talk. What we're going to be doing there is we're going to talk about nitty-gritty practical dialogue tips. Seven of the things that we've learned after 3,000 conversations with pro-choice people that it won't just help your pro-life conversations, it'll help all of your conversations. It helps marriages, helps your conversation with your kids, conversation you have with people about religion and evolution and all those other things. I would love to see you back here for that. Thank you so much. God bless.